Evening everyone, welcome to AWR, AWL's webinar on career options in fintech and legal tech. This is AWL's first uh, WILL series webinar. WILL here stands for Women in Legal Leadership. The webinars in this series aim to feature and promote women in legal leadership positions across Malaysia. So today's webinar, we will talk about fintech and legal tech. And you can use this to complement your current legal practice or to specialize in it later on. I'm Denise, your moderator for today. I'm currently an ex-co of AWL and a member and a lawyer practicing in KL at Kisensio and Hui. So our webinar is scheduled to last for one hour, one and a half hours. The first hour will be for our speakers discussion and the remaining 30 minutes will be for Q&As from our audience. If you have any questions during the discussions, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box in Zoom, and we'll try to answer it during the Q&A session later. Now let me introduce our two speakers today, Ms. Jenna Huiqing and Ms. Melissa Lim Shi Hui. Jenna and Melissa were actually classmates previously in law school, and they come from similar legal backgrounds. They were both um, in legal practice in their first few years. Jenna has since left legal practice, and she has now specialized in fintech. She is presently the CEO and co-founder of a cybersecurity company called Fort Ninja, which has a presence in Australia, Malaysia, and Hong Kong. Jenna has been featured in the top 100 women in the fintech magazine of 2020, and in prestige Malaysia 40 under 40 in 2020. Melissa, has, Melissa, on the other hand, has remained in legal profession and has specialized in, amongst others, legal tech. She is the founding partner of her own boutique law firm, Melissa Lim & Associates, which specializes in advising tech startups about their legal problems. She is a consultant in Law Asia 365, the only legal tech consultancy firm in Malaysia, and she has recently started a Malaysia Law Lawyer and Tech Discord server to bring lawyers and tech together. Jenna and Melissa are both co-founders of Law Tech Malaysia, a corporation which aims to promote effective and long-term digital transformation in the legal industry in Malaysia and Asia. So without further ado, let us move on to the discussion portion of our webinar today. And I shall start by asking our speakers to kindly explain the areas, their areas of specialty and what had led them to thread down their respective paths. Maybe I can invite Jenna to speak first. Thanks, Denise. Thanks, AWL, for having us. Um, so I think for, for me, um, FinTech is very simple. It's a combination of finance and technology. So you can look at where um, a bank are uh, going into like e-wallet space, for example. So that's really going to, you know, technology. But then you, on the other hand, you have the tech fin, where, you know, your traditional grab, your transportation, your e-commerce, your social media, like Facebook going, Facebook pay, uh, WeChat, uh, we, we pay, for example and grab becoming grab pay. So that's, that's roughly, um, you know, what FinTech is. I'll hand over to Melissa. Hey guys, uh, thank you very much AWL for having me. Um, so legal tech um, is pretty simple as well. I think that legal tech um, have three branches. One is how law firms, uh, law firms use tech to deliver their legal services better. Um, another hand is how the lay people can access uh, justice easier, meaning um, to go to court. Uh, better and to bring uh, their matter to court better and to bring uh, their matters to lawyers better as well. And the third one is how our judiciary deliver their services, not services, sorry, judiciary deliver justice uh, more transparently and more effectively. So tech is basically just a tool that will help all of these three, uh, three groups of people. Um, could I perhaps ask you both to explain briefly how you guys found yourself going down fintech and legal tech respectively? Because as I understand it, you guys previously used to be lawyers, right? You both came from legal background. So how did you find yourself venturing into legal tech and fintech? Okay, so I think uh, for me, it started a little bit with fintech first. So I used to, so Jenna uh, went into fintech first and then I kind of got dragged along to go to fintech events, you know, to SC and things like that. And then um, there was a call for a legal tech uh, hackathon uh, in 2018. And that is how I got into legal tech by organizing our first uh, legal tech hackathon in Malaysia. And then from there, it is like a, it is like one thing led to another. Then there is a, we started a company, which is Law Tech Malaysia. 
and then now a consultant in Law Asia 365 um, as a legal tech consultancy company. And Jenna, you want to share about your fintech journey, how you got into fintech, and then got me into it. <laughs> um, so I think honestly, uh, when I started, it could be what, 2016, that was really, really early. Um, you will not be able to study fintech. There was no formal education, nothing. I think, I think first and foremost, yes, I was a lawyer. Uh, I was actually classmates with Melissa. We actually did the whole chambering, the whole app being called to the bar and everything. And I was also was quite active in like, for example, Young Lawyers Committee. That's how I met Danny, for example. And, and I think those are the journey that we're familiar with. But how I got into tech first is that I, I, I was actually doing a lot of networking events as well dealing with a lot of startups, uh, entrepreneurs out there. And when I was on my own doing consultancy after, after getting out of law, what happened is I actually was recruited to join Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, the government side, to build fintech ecosystem for Malaysia. So dealing with the regulators like Central Bank and Securities Commission. So that's how I got uh, into fintech actually. I was actually recruited. There was no job scope. I was supposed to create my own job scope, draft my own JD because the human resource side did not understand what I was doing and really crafted my whole job scope for the next two years. So it was very interesting where instead of um, understanding precedence and studying case laws like how we used to in law, uh, I was actually crafting case laws, for example, and precedence for fintech. So that's how uh, I got into it. Dennis? You both sound like you're really like pioneers in your own areas, right? Because you're so experienced in it. You started off fintech and legal tech essentially or were one of the starting people, right, in these areas. So maybe I could ask you guys, what, uh, how developed actually is fintech and legal tech in Malaysia? Because you both seem very young. So it doesn't seem like, it, it seems like quite a new thing. Thank God we, we look young. <laughs> so, so that's good. <laughs> I guess it's, it's quite interesting where when we look at fintech and legal tech, I would dare say that we're not pioneers because outside of Malaysia, there are, there are a lot of them uh, who started maybe 10 years ago, for example. It's just that the term may not be legal tech or fintech. But for Malaysia, uh, for fintech, it's very well developed. Uh, it is already, you know, licenses and new regulations and approvals uh, for those who uh, understand and, and follow the news like digital bank, um, electronic know your customer, and, and all these are already approved and regulated in Malaysia by both Central Bank, Malaysia, and Securities Commission. And it is a very, very big economy now for fintech. There are a lot of careers, uh, new companies, even foreign companies stepping foot into Malaysia. So it's very encouraging uh, and, and there are a lot of, I know a lot of employers are looking for people. So it is, it is a booming uh, industry right now and, and it's uh, developing quite aggressively, I would say. So I'll pass this to Melissa. Thanks, Jenna. Um, for legal tech, um, yeah, again, I wouldn't say that we are like a pioneer, in, a pioneer um, maybe in Malaysia, because that was the kind of like the first uh, legal, it was the first um, legal tech hackathon. But legal tech has been around, like even your LexisNexis and CLJ, that is part of legal tech. It's just that um, nobody kind of like, in Malaysia, nobody kind of like differentiate it, I think. But about how developed it is in Malaysia, legal tech is still at its infancy right now. Um, although we do see a lot of improvements, uh, a majority of which is from the judiciary. For example, the judiciary, I think uh, last year, April, April last year, they had their first online hearing, uh, which was actually streamed on YouTube live. So that was actually really, really fun to watch because we, you see people commenting as well and then you realize, oh, the comments shouldn't be there, you know, and then they stop the comments. So it is a learning process and you can see that uh, the judiciary is very active in innovating all this within, I think within three months, they managed to change the legislations and uh, introduce new policies in order to uh, get this online hearing to happen. And since then, we've seen a lot of new platforms by the judiciary. However, outside of the judici judiciary though, a lot of work still needs to be done. I think that uh, from the lawyer's uh, point of view, from the layman's point of view, um, especially the perspective of uh, Malaysians towards lawyers, uh, I think that is one of the things that we need to change. And we can change it by improving access to justice. Yeah, it's still a lot of work to be done. So 
I wanted to know actually, how has legal tech and fintech progressed overseas? Is it very different from the scene in Malaysia right now? How far ahead are they if they are ahead? Is there a potential for Malaysia to move in that direction? Um, so I think fintech really is, is uh, it draws from the existing finance and banking system and, and regulation, re- regulations as well. So if you look at overseas, uh, we, we, the, globally actually everyone is looking at UK. Uh, financial Conduct Authority, which is the regulator over there that's coming out with all this uh, fintech innovation. And I think we can always draw inspiration from overseas, but I think the question is which business model and which solution makes sense for us, for example. So interestingly, uh, Securities Commission Malaysia, for example, is one of the first regulator that launched the new regulation called Equity Crowdfunding and Peer-to-Peer Financing in ASEAN region. So that's that's very encouraging because it looks like the regulators are keeping up with regulation and also trying to make sure that we are also keeping up with welcoming innovation in the system. So those are the few examples. If you also look at um, how we also are currently um, having things like digital asset exchange, which people always link to cryptocurrencies. So those are also regulated right now uh, and and you know, watched over by the regulators. So fintech, it also becomes a a very, it's always fun, right? If we can get, you know, overseas business models coming into Malaysia. But but again, uh, our regulators in Malaysia are always very specific into welcoming um, financial or fintech solutions that cater and benefit to the population uh, and different segments of population like B40 group, M40, um, so and so on. So those are the things that, is prioritized by the regulators. Uh, for legal tech, on the other hand, I think that uh, I think that overseas market is definitely uh leaps and bounds ahead of us, especially UK and Australia. I think Australia is very quite stable already um in legal tech, and you can see that UK is innovating a lot. And I think the main the main uh factor is what like what Jenna said just now about adapting and accepting change. And I think that is something that Malaysians are pretty, I mean, Malaysians as a whole is pretty um, resistant against um, change. So that is one mindset that I think uh, needs to needs to improve. But another thing is that when you look overseas, you will see, okay, for example, I, I'm, I'm going to give a China example just because I was there. Um, it is amazing uh, how they run their courts, for example. So when you go to court in China, you go to a kiosk, much like our QMS uh, kiosk, and you do a facial recognition, and they will tell you where is your case, no matter if you are a lawyer or layman. It works across the board, even layman. But of course, that's China. La. For us, maybe not facial recognition, IC, just entering your IC, and you know you can it will direct you to where you are supposed to go. They have this huge board, like, uh, like when you go to airport, <laughs> that huge board, they have that. And their court rules are actually um, fitted with AI. So you can just say, you know, like, okay, Google, you you can just say, okay, look for this president for me. The judge can say that, and there's this speaker, and and the AI will reply you. But is that what we need in Malaysia? And is that something that we can implement in Malaysia? I believe that right now, what we really, really need is to improve um, access to justice first. We need to, we need to um, so-called motivate uh, lawyers because we are lawyers are the driving force. We need to be able to motivate lawyers and laymen and then uh, move on to connect all stakeholders in order to innovate further. Because just like FinTech, okay, if Malaysians are not kitted, kit with a smartphone, e-wallet cannot happen because nobody have that to, to use it. So what is that key factor that is needed by all Malaysians to be able to interact with, uh, legal, uh, with legal, the legal industry? So we need to be able to identify that. And I think that lawyers play a huge role in that. If I'm hearing you right, Melissa, you're saying, uh, what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the main challenge in 
with regards to legal tech in Malaysia, it's the resistance coming from the lawyers themselves and the judiciary primarily. Is that is that the main challenge or are there other challenges? Like, is there infrastructure challenges or uh, funding and all that? I don't think that uh, the resistance, um, I don't think that that is uh, the, uh, not quite the right way I would put it. I would say that it is the infrastructure and knowledge. I think that everybody has to um, get into the get into this because a lot of people don't understand tech even. Don't say legal tech, just to understand tech and how to apply it in your daily life. So that is one thing, right? On how do you manage your law firm using tech? And that will require infrastructure, like uh, infra- yeah, infrastructure. So how do we get that? I did a poll the other day in the Malaysian, uh, in, in a in a Facebook group. I was informed that there are even lawyers who don't who don't have a laptop, so they are unable to work from home. And in the first MCO. We have heard a lot of stories about how um, clients are unable to contact their lawyers because their lawyers are not in the law firm. So these are the things, I think the biggest challenge right now is the knowledge and the infrastructure. So with knowledge, when you understand legal tech and how it will benefit you, you will automatically search out the right infrastructure for you because the infrastructure is already there. You just need to be able to adopt it in. Uh, Jenna, so I'm coming back to you. Since what what do you think is the main challenge faced in with with regards to fintech? Because we've heard about legal tech already, but so what what is the challenge that um fintech has in in Malaysia at least? For for my I mean from my perspective, it is definitely the fintech talents. We're having a surge of innovation companies coming in, and the economy is growing, but. I think a lot of uh, employers uh, or fintech companies, for example, or even the innovation department in banks are finding hard to find uh, the right person, the right fit for a certain scope of work that they are looking for. So I think that's the first challenge. Second challenge would be still obviously the regulation because it's always ever evolving and not everything is out on, you know, on the regulation. There are little things like the approach, how you tackle certain risks when you put it in documents. Uh, it is quite different from you know, just the legal risk, for example, or regulation risk. It could be reputation risk that is considered financial risk, for example, and, and all, all these little things or what kind of impact that you put on the whole um, financial, finance and banking system when a, a new player comes in. So are you looking at a capital risk, for example, as well? So I think second one, the regulations is still ever-changing and it always will be an evolving thing, building it together with the regulators and other collaboration with players. The third challenge that I see potentially is that it will be definitely cyber security and cyber risk, uh, which is always a new area, which is what I'm focusing on as well. So I think cyber security will be another threat uh, or risk or challenge, I would say, because now everyone is going online. But I think it's a, in a way, a different type of crime that is happening, a different type of fraud that is happening. So those are the few challenges I see, Denise. Okay. So actually, from from what I hear from both of you, it seems like a common trend in both legal and fintech is a certain lack of knowledge or lack of talent, right? Perhaps you could explain to us how these hopeful people could venture or get the knowledge to venture into, say, fintech or legal tech? So I think uh, really, if you want, you want to talk about practical tips and uh, that's that's where, I mean, you can look out for it. Uh, that's where I actually created uh, with my team something called the e-fintech school, which is a one-month school for working professionals after working hours and you are connected and taught by uh, practitioners rather than academics. So I think that's one way. It always runs every six months. So it's always July or October, November, for example, just check out uh, Fort Ninja or just Google eFintech School. The second way is to really keep track of fintech news. Um, there's a lot of, it's, it's called Fintech News Malaysia, for example. And those are valid sources of news where even the regulators do participate in announcing as well. 
the, the third one will be going to Facebook group like Fintech Malaysia. There's a lot of players out there doing comments, uh, shouting out the latest regulation. I, told, I think those are the three. Obviously, the fourth one is if you know any Fintech friends, just you know bring them out. I mean, not now, <laughs> uh, but then you give them a call, give them a text, have a chat. I think that's that's going to be quite useful. Um, before that, I think uh, I would just want to add on about the challenges, right, about uh, that legal tech has. I think what Jenna said about Fintech would be a challenge for uh, legal tech in the future. Why? Because Fintech has, is already uh, more mature, you see. So we can actually take um, lessons from that and then implement it now for legal tech. Okay, about how, how, how you can get involved with legal tech in Malaysia. I will always be talking about baseline because we are there right now. So first of all, uh, lawyers who are, you know, when you are talking to, when lawyer is, when one lawyer is talking to another lawyer, we will be talking about law and our cases. So add tech into it. So talk about tech more. Number one, uh, one of the things, um, one of the places that they can do that is uh, my Discord channel, uh, my Discord server that I created. You can go there, we hold um, workshops and you just talk about tech there. So you can join that. But another thing is maybe join subcommittees in the BC. Because as lawyers, that is the place that we can do policy changes, right? Nobody else can get in there other than lawyers. So do that. And also attend any um, any legal tech festivals uh, that is coming up. I think uh, every October, Singapore will have that uh, tech law fest. Uh, so join that. And also, you know how Google has that alarm, the alert button, sorry, <laughs> the alert button. So alert yourself with legal tech because learning about what other jurisdictions are doing will actually bring you up to date. Although there are some things that may not be applicable, like for example, the facial recognition thing, right? But it can be something that it can it is some it can be something that we aspire to and then remove model it for the use of Malaysia. Yeah, that's that three lah. <laughs> I, I would recommend people to join Melissa's Discord. I jumped in. I'm like a newbie there, but it's a lot of materials and you can always get in touch with Melissa there. So it's very new. Okay, so coming back to your point. Um, okay, so I would like to ask maybe Melissa, how how would someone who wants to start going and getting into the legal scene, getting uh, specializing their practice to legal tech, how would they go around doing that, right? Because you said that there's not many places you can learn legal tech and you have to pick up knowledge as you go. So how do you market yourself? Like I said, legal tech is at its infancy in Malaysia. So what we are basically doing as legal tech uh, advocates, I would say legal tech advocates or legal tech champions, is that we are just defining and redefining our boundaries about what we can do with, uh, with tech. I think uh, recently we've been talking about virtual office uh, to be pushed through for law firms. Um, we've been talking about uh, cyber, uh, cyber laws to be changed. Um, I think uh, ease in nature as well. So this kind of these are the kind of things that we need to keep abreast of. And secondly, if you want to say practice legal tech as an area of practice, just like how uh, just like what you do for civil litigation, I don't think that uh, that is something that you do. But what you can do is you can be like a consultant for legal tech uh, companies, right? For them to grow, because right now we don't have that many legal tech service providers in Malaysia. A lot that that sprouted years ago have kind of died off a little bit. Um, I don't really see much. Uh, okay, I see two that came up during this MCO. I think that's the easy law that just came up with their own accounting software. And uh, one more is the bundling uh, the bundling uh, website that just came up by one month of fun, I think. So that, that's uh, really, really cool that they have that. I think that legal tech uh, lawyers, what they can do is they can implement tech into their, their uh, practice, into their firms. How do they run their firm with tech and how do they create new law firms? So firms that is using new law. <laughs> so that's a, a phrase, right? New law firms. Um, I have people who told me like, hey, what if I want to run my firm like a GLP, but using tech? So I said, yeah, it's a GLP with tech. <laughs> so that, that, that's not, uh, you know, that's not um, jump, lah, I think. And uh, I think that then you said here, um, can I share how I do it in my firm, right? Which is uh, exactly what I said, having a practice management system that works and about using effective communication skill, effective communication channel, 
both for your internal and external, one client facing and one uh, within your staff, your uh, between your staff. So I think that is how you do that. But most importantly, we need to look into how we can push more legal tech, make legal tech products into the market so that we can grow legal tech as a whole in Malaysia. Um, I noticed that Jenna shared some information in the chat earlier. She's, she's mentioned some of her peers who have transitioned in-house, right? Being take, jumping into fintech projects. So Jenna, can I ask you, for, for these hopeful applicants, how would they tailor their CV or sort of present themselves to potential employers so that they get into these big fintech projects and positions? Um, I think it would be quite interesting to, you know, uh, start joining the like fintech networking events and uh, webinars as well, because then you get familiarized with some of the terms and terminology. I think that's the first one. Second one is you could get, you know, people who are already in it to actually, you know, introduce you to potential jobs, because that's a, a gateway for you to get into the group or into the network, for example. Uh, and the third one, uh, which is, I'm not sure whether everyone knows this, but it's actually quite Quite, it's actually quite hard to apply to get a fintech job. You got to really, uh, you know, know someone and and also get introduced in because a lot of times uh, people actually get a lot of referrals and they they have someone in mind. So it's it's no longer all in Job Street. Like for example, I think back then Job Street, for example, it's a uh, it's a very common place where to hunt for jobs. But right now, especially for fintech, it's it's good to get the first stepping stone. So is it a first internship in a fintech company or is it a fintech mentor that you are you're looking out for? Those are the little things that I think will be will give you a long way to start your fintech career. Are there certain skills or qualifications which employers in this area look out specifically for like a specific degree or certain courses? Is there anything that applicants could get to sort of improve their position? I think because there is no like fintech degree right now, uh, there are some popping out here and there and you can get a short courses um, here and there as well. But I think the key thing is employers actually don't really look at a degree. Uh, that's the first one. Second, they are looking for your practical experience or certain interests that you have. So is it, for example, you have experience, you know, putting in an application a fintech application uh, is it that you came from a corporate background so you actually uh, it's very good at due diligence when you're doing your IPO for example uh, it could be where you've done a lot of litigation or court cases so you may be very good at you know, it could be an intellectual property case, for example. So it could be you are being brought in to really protect the brand. I think the other thing is you got to understand also what kind of interest you like. Are you looking for the more on the risk side or more of an innovation side or product side or security side? What is it? So those are the things that I think employers look at. Uh, it's, it's quite different from, you know, what we do when we study. You know, when you can't study something, you got to look out for practical experience and, and networks as well. Sorry, Jenna, I think I have another follow-up question to that. Um, so for fintech, it sounds like there are certain areas, right? There's risk and securities and something else you mentioned. What, what are the differences in this area? So I think you have like putting in application, right? So that's nothing to do with like risk and compliance that, that we're quite familiar with. And then you have, you know, like there, there's so many areas. It could be even where you're good at marketing. So because in, in fintech, you can't really simply market out. It's not like e-commerce, for example. So you got to make sure that you're not uh, misrepresenting to the users out there, to the public at large. And, you know, it could be you're very interested in the user experience. So you could be, you know, managing the product with maybe the tech team or the designers, for example. So fintech is uh, it's, it's really, really open. Uh, it could be because you actually are very good at dealing with the judges, for example, previously. And now you may want to transfer that skill set to managing the regulators. So that's what I did. Uh, I actually transferred that skill set um, from law to actually managing uh, Central Bank and Securities Commission um, you know, previously. So it really depends on your interests and, and where you want to scope it out. Because that COVID had come about, a lot of things have moved, right? From office, you've 
now working from home, a lot of things have gone virtual. How has that changed fintech? And then after this, I would also like Melissa to answer how that has changed the ecotech because I think Melissa has also explained a bit earlier, but maybe you can hear a bit more about I think for fintech, you also can include finance and banking. So finance and banking is considered like essential services. So I actually speak to some of the banks, they will still continue on um, and then, you know, continue to resume their work. But I think for fintech, um, I think it's quite different with, where day from day one with we've gotten used to doing work remote. So everyone could be in different countries and and people actually use things like Slack, Zoom, Teams, and, and emails, for example. So I think for FinTech, normally, uh, because from day one, we've already practiced things like working remote and managing the team as well. So a lot of times, uh, it is not disrupted. I think the only thing disrupted, for example, could be uh, meeting the regulators in person. Uh, because you, you can't do it right now. Or, you know, maybe you want to do market expansion so you can't meet, you know, uh, people uh, on the grounds. So those are the little things, but generally it's, it's not really impacted because it's tech, yeah, tech-based. I think uh, legal tech is much the reverse of what Jenna said because uh, we are not tech run. We cannot, uh, you know, one person in another country and we can run that. Uh, I mean, we can, but in Malaysia, we have not adopted that before the MCO. So this MCO actually, if you want to put a positive uh, spin in things, I think that it's great for innovation because you see law firms, uh, you know, finally using uh, Google Drive, let's say. Google Drive itself, I think that is a very... Honestly, I think that Google Workspace itself is a very, um, very uh, powerful tool to use, um, especially if you are a small law firm. Uh, I used to run my law firm via Slack, but then I hated it and liked uh, Discord, so now I'm uh, shifting to Discord. I think that the MCO had bring a lot of um, changes in the way law firms work. Uh, however, there are plenty of law firms who are, number one, unable to do that because they don't have the infrastructure, uh, or number two, they do not want to do that. So we, we, need to, we need to, like I said, share that knowledge so that we can uh, boost this up, right? Uh, secondly is that uh, we do see that the judiciary is coming up with a lot of uh, new ways to uh, improve access of justice, but there are gaps like for example, commission of oaths, you know, they, they are not allowed to run, so operate, so we can't um, get our affidavits of form. But the court has um, so uh, some sort of like given a leeway with that, right? But how great is it if we are able to come up with a platform where lawyers, commission of oath and the court is, uh, you know, is uh, linked. So that, that would be great. I think uh, UK had done something like that. Uh, which is something that I think we can uh, put into in Malaysia. Yeah, I think that the MCO had brought a lot of changes in legal tech. We just need to grow it now. So Melissa, actually from what you said, it sounds like there are a lot of gaps in terms of legal tech in Malaysia. Are these gaps that, say, new businesses could take advantage of, right? Like there's certain not lack of knowledge with certain lawyers, maybe they could do classes, or if there's this platform you, you've proposed, for commissioner of oaths to sign and affirm documents virtually, are these areas that we should probably or like potential people may look into to do a business? Yeah, definitely. And I think lawyers should jump on that wagon because nobody can tell, okay, because all right, the tech is already there, right? And tech people are ready to develop something for the legal industry already. The problem is they don't know how the legal industry works. They don't know why is it so important for the commission of oath to see that person signing in front of them. Because tech people would be like, hey, yeah, just e sign. Ah. But why we can't do that? In the beginning of the first MCO, um, there were circulars and everything about how you can't sign SBA um, through Zoom meeting. So why is it? So tech people need lawyers to go, jump in and tell them, look, these are the parameters. Okay, these are the parameters and I think that the solution is A, B, C, D. So can you develop something like that? So they can jump into so-called uh, legal tech by being a consultant to these service providers. Um, honestly, there are a lot. Um, there's this bunch of developers who created a Discord server and they specifically created a legal tech channel because they want to, um, they want to interact with lawyers. 
but there are only, I think, three of us in there. So we need to grow that. And that is what I intend for the, uh, for the other one as well. But I think legal tech can work two ways, right? One, you can, as a lawyer, jump with the uh, services provide, uh, service providers to create new businesses. And that would be great because it will create a market. But secondly, you can also be an entrepreneur and help to bring changes within the firm. Because partners, they will always say, okay, you know what? Why don't you suggest something to me? And then we will see the cost and we will see whether we can implement. The trouble is that a lot of people think that, oh, I cannot approach my partner. But that's not true. I don't think that that is true. If that is true, law, law, a law firm runs by uh, sharing of knowledge, you know, streaming from up to down. So I don't think that uh, that, that uh, is a very much of a barrier. So do try to approach that and try to change the way you work. Start from there and then influence outside and join BC. Just following up on that a little bit more. It sounds a lot like legal tech in Malaysia is at a stage where it, it's a technology that needs to be adopted by local practices, right? By law firms, individual law firms. I think Santi has said in the chat actually that a lot of lawyers actually don't prioritize creating a legal tech budget. Um, and then there's a generally an unwillingness to spend money on legal tech. Is there any solutions you could propose to this? Um, I think that uh, I will circle back to what I said earlier, which is that the knowledge is lacking here. So you will never ever be able to find value in something if you do not know that what that thing is. Just for, just like if you have never, it is just like you can't miss something that you have never had. So what I think is, if you want to start out small, okay, like how all startups and, and SME manage their risks, right? Start with Google Workspace. Start with Google Workspace. It is free. Okay, and I bet you, you are already using Gmail and Google Drive. You know, even if you are already using Outlook and you want to tell me that, oh, I'm in the Microsoft ecosystem, I do not want to move to Google. You can, you can, because Microsoft, um, I'm sure that you are not using 100% of their function. One way or another, you interact with Google, you know, you can, you use Google search, move to Google Workspace, get the free version first, try it out, try it out to the maximum and know what is the value. And then if you want to upgrade from that, Google Workspace uh, charges per, per, per user. But more importantly, there are a lot of um, practice management systems that actually charge per user as well. And I think the closest one to us is Clio, which is in Singapore. Uh, I don't think there's one in Malaysia. Like, I don't think there's one as full suite as, um, uh, as uh, Clio in Malaysia, I would say. There are some accounting softwares that has practice management system within them, like core matters, but there is no full suite uh, practice management system. And that is one of the knowledge that I mentioned, right? A lot of people, they have that thing, they have core matters and they think that this is what practice management is and therefore I do not want to spend money on it because it's very hard to use and it doesn't help my firm. But that's not true. So try out something that works which is cheap or free, and then you can upgrade from that. So work like a startup, basically. A lot of us have adopted like Google Drive and we're now on Zoom. We never, I think some of us have never heard of Zoom even before MCO suddenly it's everywhere. Exactly. So Jenna, I wanted to ask, right, because we know that legal tech, the main consumers of legal tech would be law firms and people who are in, involved in legal proceedings and everything. But for fintech, because it has to do with finance, is it, are the main um, consumers basically banks and their customers? Are they, what, what other in, um, area industries would have an interest in fintech? You think? People like me and you. So for example, uh, you know, like Touch and Go Wallet, um, Alipay, for those who use that uh, when you travel, for example. Uh, me and you, we're also the consumers, uh, businesses who actually accept uh, as merchants. So it could be like things like Razorpay that you see uh, at 7-Eleven. Uh, banks, definitely. Fintechs, everyone will be users and consumers as well. Uh, not to forget corporations. Uh, governments can also be a user of fintech and regulators as well. That's going to be a subset like uh, things like, I don't think we're going to go there, uh, reg tech, like regulatory technology. So those are the little things uh, that we, that, that are the users of fintech. I could maybe I could invite you guys to explain to us what you think the future of fintech and legal tech look like in Malaysia. Uh, it's it's definitely gonna be not what 
I know right now. It's going to be uh, changing because there are going to be a lot of players. Like, I think it's really to understand what are the needs of the economy. With COVID right now, a lot of displacements of jobs and a lot of business models are wiped out, for example, because of COVID. So it also means that there's a new segment of people or consumers or businesses or even banks are looking for a different way to meet those needs. Whether you want to look at financial needs or, you know, it could be a business need, it could be an existing finance and banking need that was ignored or not catered to or it couldn't be, you know, penetrated, for example. So it's going to be very, very different. Uh, I, I don't think I can imagine it now in five, ten years. But the other thing is it could be a whole spectrum of legal, uh, like, you know, I think legal tech will be the same. The fintech uh, career paths will be also very different. So I'll give you an example. There could be a fintech AI ethics person, you know, because you understand fintech, but because you came from a law and you you know how to delve into, you know, like philosophy and AI ethics, it could be a blockchain risk assessment. It could be, you know, I, I can't really imagine all this now, but yeah, the, the world is an oyster. And the other thing is definitely there'll be a lot of jobs out there, uh, even right now. Five years from now, huh? I think that a lot of law firms will definitely work more, uh, with, uh, will interact more with tech. I don't know how far it will be, but probably Zoom meetings uh, will be a norm already. Uh, but I think that the judiciary will be even more changi than now, I think, um, because they seem to be in the forefront uh, of, innovate, of legal tech innovation now. With regards to jobs, I really, I really think that the market, I mean, being uh, putting a positive spin on things, right? I think that lawyers, uh, once they know about legal tech, they will realize that, uh, oh, okay, I need to grow this market, and they will probably join our service providers in order to to grow that. We can, we may also see something that is happening uh, around. I think uh, in UK and in Singapore as well, where law firms have their own innovation hub. Uh, like in Singapore, I think Clifford Chance has a has their own um, innovation hub, uh, which is where they have like this tech um tech team attached um to the firm uh, in order to create innovation for the use of the firm. And I think uh, I, I don't know if they will be commercialized it uh, later on or not, but that would be something that is uh fun uh fun to see, interesting to see. Uh, one more thing, I think, uh, new law. You know, since GRP is already um is already approved, and we can see that because of the MC, the effects of MCO, we see law firms um closing down, but we also see a lot of small little uh law firms uh mushrooming. So maybe we will be able to bunch everyone into a GLP and everything run by tech. And if you are able to get virtual office up. It's like, it it will be so amazing. Like Jenna said, uh, the world will be the oyster. Melissa, I want to follow up with that question, with a question. Do you think that with the introduction of legal tech, lawyers will eventually find themselves out of a job? Because with the introduction of AI, you have computers maybe drafting contracts and um, you won't need to go for case management, right? You can just, I don't know, click a button. Right? You never know. So do you think that this is something lawyers should be concerned with? Or do you think that you create more opportunities? I think that that is an age old question. Uh, but I don't think that it will put lawyers out of a job. If you look at historically, right, how how lawyers run their practice last time, you know, in the olden days, they wouldn't be doing what we are doing now. <laughs> they wouldn't be doing what we are doing now with all the bundling and all the... That, they, that will be left to the clubs. And now you don't need clubs. You can leave it to bots to do that. So the human element will always be needed regardless if it's fintech, legal tech, health tech. Even health tech is coming up now. Does it mean that we will not need lawyer, uh, doctors after this? There's no, there's no such thing. And if you look at it, uh, look at it as well. There is not one profit, uh, one occupation that is, that has been rendered redundant because of tech. Last time you have writers and clubs, and now you have, and then they move to typewriters, and now we still need clubs, right? Although we have the computer, they, I think the only, um, there is this profession. I think, uh. Lift operator. Okay, that is one that we didn't need, but I'm sure they become bellboy or something, and we still have bellboys now in hotels, right? Lawyers, I think, at the end of the day, we will be able to um so-called claim back our role, which is to advise people with uh about the law, which is to to practice law and to facilitate the uh, delivery of justice. 
And that is supposed to be our core mission and core uh, practice, you see. Not all these admin works that we are doing right now. Last time when we spoke before this talk, you mentioned uh, technology, or was it Jenna, that they could bundle automatically. I mean, bundles of authorities, you could just list down the cases and then press a button and it prints out on its own. That sounds amazing. Maybe you can get that here in Malaysia soon. <laughs> So maybe you could both share with us your individual next uh, top three tap steps, right? For aspiring people who want to venture into fintech or legal tech. I think the right. first uh, top three steps, we, the first one is uh, as lawyers, you will be reading a lot. So get your first, your reading materials, whether it's from people that you know, from fintech news or Facebook, you know, uh, fintech Malaysia. The second one is, you know, your normal, you know, what, what you do, right? When you go to chambering or when you start your first year, second year, you always tap into your legal network, right? Or maybe you have friends who are working in the court room so you know number two is get people uh, if you want to start your fintech career i already put my linkedin if you want to connect i'm happy to share and the third one is to find what you really like so you have a chance to you know start a new career or a new journey so is it that you like a the law or maybe you like the marketing side or you like the product side there is no requirement for you to really study like a three four year degree you can always pick up a short course on Udemy or Han Academy, for example. Uh, you can even pick up coding if you like. <laughs> so we ran a coding workshop before uh, for lawyers. It's doable. And I think uh, it is sometimes just be courageous to take the first step. So, so those are my top three. Top three, I think, first of all, a perspective and attitude change. Um, as lawyers, we tend to be very, we tend to hold on, you know, to precedence. Even law students are, are uh, into that now. I don't know why I have interns and they tell me, oh, you know, that, that uh, what is this particular uh, phrase? And I said, yeah, we are defining that now. So that is uh, what legal tech is right now, right? Because it's at its infancy. Um, so first of all, join workshops. I think uh, a lot of the state bars are having their own tech workshops. Join that. Don't be afraid of that. You know, let's see how other people interact with it and then interact with it yourself um, first. Then secondly, um, share knowledge. Share knowledge among each other. Thirdly, you got to be a bit more active to make policy changes and also to bring this market up. So how do you do that? Is to just be involved in the community, actually. Nothing much, because legal tech, we are, we are still growing the whole field, you see. So it's just being in the community. Start with the Q&A session. M.Y. Chang has asked, has the Malaysian fintech and tech industry considered privacy and data minimization? I think this is for Jenna. She has asked, how do you balance technological innovations and convenience with privacy? She gives an example. The facial recognition system in China, as mentioned, is enabled by a lot of data collection and processing, which has adverse consequences when it comes to privacy. Jenna, quick, could let us have a view on this. Um, I think data is a very important topic right now. So if you borrow the concept from EU, for example, of course you will understand about things like GDPR, but I think there's a, also an evolution right to be forgotten. So tech per se and data, it's, it's not regulated. I would dare say that because it's always evolving and trying to understand which who who in the government, for example, is taking care of that. Uh, but what happened is fintech borrows uh, that data privacy regulation or GDPR, for example. For example, so those are intertwined. Um, and how do you balance innovation, and convenience, and privacy? Honestly, it is also up to the user. Uh, so you got to really, really know how the data is being processed and collected and being used. So, for example, I'm not sure whether any everyone knows here, but WhatsApp is linked to Facebook. So there's a way where whatever you place on WhatsApp will be analyzed, um, and then you may suddenly see something an ad popped up. But if you really don't want a convenience, then you opt out, right? And then delete all your data, for example. So it's sometimes really come to uh, being user empowered uh, and understanding what you want to use um, and what you don't want to use. I think China is very different because they have a different system and everyone, uh, for example, no longer uses cash over there. And they're all using electro electronic payments, even the hawker shop uh, as well. So there's pros and cons. For example, during COVID, that's amazing because then you minimize the risk of exposure and, and transmission. 
So I, I hope that answers a bit of question. And facial recognition, uh, of course, you got to really understand where the data is stored, right? So if, you know, some, some of it, they're not storing your facial aspects of data, they're just processing it. And uh, sometimes it's actually stored in your mobile phone rather than their servers. So you've got to really understand the, the nitty gritty. Thanks, Jenna. I think, uh, just to clarify, I think we said GDPR earlier. I think you mean the General Data Protection Regulation in EU, right? Um, yes. We have the Personal Data Protection Act in Malaysia. Correct. Is it Correct. similar? Is it different? Is, so, is it, yeah. So GDPR covers way, way more. Um, if let's say, even though let's say you're in Malaysia, but you have a European client, you're actually bound because I'm not sure whether a lot of people are aware of that. And um, the other thing is uh, you're not just looking at like European, like corporate clients. If you have one European client, uh, you're actually bound um, to rise up to the GDPR standards. So even though you have PDPA, uh, which is the common uh, standards that we are following right now, uh, GDPR exceeds beyond that. And there's a lot of controls and, and even, you know, like consent uh, from the users that is required for you to really step up and match the standard that is required by GDPR. In relation to fintech, because a lot of the users are <clears throat> who are using fintech, are big banks and international organizations, they're also bound by this GDPR because they have presences in this European country. So it's, they don't just comply with the PDAPA standard here, they Correct. go beyond that. Correct. So let's say they have a branch in Singapore, for example, or Malaysia, but because they are connected to some of the headquarters or overseas branch, um, and I think it's it's very interesting where uh, for, for me, when, when I run Fort Ninja, I've already started, you know, complying GDPR, um, even though we're not in Europe, because our counterparts or partners or clients uh, are complying that. So it's, it's that uh, reach that you're you're looking at and collaboration in, in the business world. That sounds really good. It makes you feel a bit better about the privacy. Coming back to legal tech then, um, is there any issue with data privacy, do you think, um, Melissa? How, how do you see data privacy being infringed in terms of legal tech? Because I think legal tech is mostly about how the courts want to handle their cost papers, maybe their case management. That's, that's how I think about it right now. Um, of course, there will be some things that we need to consider. For example, law firms, we, um, we of course process a lot of data, a lot of uh, private and personal data. So it is, I think that, for example, like the GDPR, right, and the difference with our PDPA is that in, in um, EU, they are very they are, they are very very protective of their own um, EU citizens, or especially when it comes to privacy, and Malaysia can do the same. Uh, but for the legal legal fraternity, um, in uh, specifically, we will need to be very very careful with the tech that we use, and that is why BC is very important, right? And that is why we tried to amend the uh, LPA in order to, uh, give some sort of uh, at least a gu a guide. Uh, when it comes to legal tech, for example, where your server um, is to be is to be held and things like that. So I think that data pri uh, data privacy is definitely something that we will need to grow as legal tech grow. And uh yeah, and definitely something that our service provider will need to be informed of by our uh, bar council and the judiciary as well. Thanks, Melissa. It really sounds like legal tech in Malaysia it's just this infancy, sorry, and that. What we need is actually regulation and sort of structure for it. So that's something to look forward to. Um, okay. Uh, we do need, okay, for like four law, law firms, right? Four lawyers and law firms. We need the bar council to be more um, aware and more knowledgeable about tech or have a subcommittee for that in order to come up with that uh, guideline. Because no matter what, we are going to, we are going virtual. You know, the first MCO itself, everybody said, oh, you are encouraged to work from home. But nobody thought about data privacy at that time. So now, are you telling me that, um, you know, there, there is not going to be any guideline because nobody knows uh, how to do it, so don't work from home? It can't be that. We need to grow. Um, we, we need to change with time. Thank you. That was very insightful. I completely agree with you. I think yeah. fintech, both fintech and legal tech are some things that we cannot avoid. It's hard, yes, especially for some of the people who don't like learning new things, but it's something that we cannot avoid and it is direction we have to go to. So I think there's another question from Minister in the chat. Danny is asked, you mentioned that we need infrastructure in relation to legal tech. Could you maybe share how your firm has done it and how you have sort of 
you know, overcome these issues? Um, I think first of all is the hardware that you need, right? Um, in the first MCO, I think a lot of um, and and like I said, the poll that I did in the um in the Facebook group, there are lawyers who they don't even know whether um. They should. They, they don't have a laptop, and they don't know whether they should get a monitor. What webcam to use? You know, because there's so many information out there, and you can't expect every single lawyer to be that tech savvy or have that time to scroll through. You know, and and find out which one to have. So I think that that is something that, like I said, uh, bar council can help. Uh, so committees can help. I think that there's something coming up now. Uh, but yeah, first of all, get the right um set up. For your for your for your office or for your um, home, uh, getting the right uh hardware and how I do it is uh, when I started because I'm a sole proprietor. When I started, I used the Google uh, Workspace. I mean, at that time was G Suite lah. Now it's Google Workspace. So I used Google Workspace when I started out, and then when I started um expanding, I started using Slack and Asana, and then I moved everything into Discord and I program a Discord bot <laughs> to help me in Discord. So. <laughs> That that's how I do it, but I don't. Of course, I don't expect um you know uh any other, especially existing law firms to do that. So like I said uh previously, start if you if you don't know um where to start off, you can start with Google, and then after that expand to other practice management systems. Um, if you have not tried Core Matters, maybe you can give it a try. You know, Easy Pro, um, Easy Law Pro is out now. You can try that as well. Uh, Dave has mentioned that we need to build a strong foundation in terms of legal tech in Malaysia. Besides regulation and infrastructure, is there anything that maybe the bar council or the state bars can do? Would it help if the judiciary more proactively took and encouraged lawyers to get into legal tech? Because honestly, it seemed like because of the MCO, judiciary was forced to actually move into e-review using it more. So do you think it would help if there was also this push from the judiciary? Uh, honestly, I think all innovation is was because it, of the push from the judiciary. <laughs> like the e-filing, it was already there for, for so long and not all of us were on it. I think... Uh, um, I don't recall this, but I don't remember the, the exact numbers, but it was very minimal before it was made mandatory. So when it was made mandatory, they had to use it. E-review was actually there before MCO, but it wasn't available for all cases. So they pushed that as well. The judiciary is doing pretty well. It is about how all the other stakeholders that are interacting with the judiciary um, step up, you know, step up on the game. So First thing for the bar council, I can see that state bars are actually um, uh, holding out a lot more workshops these days that is centered around tech, like cyber law, cyber security, and even how to use um, to use Google Docs. Uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, the state bars are doing... Uh, oh, sorry, state bars have also done how to do e-review and e-hearing. So that's great. I re- but I really, really wish to see um, the bar council coming up with more, um, more innovation for more innovation and more guidelines. Because right now, what I can see is that just being like a liaison between the law law firms and ju- the judiciary. Like, hey, judiciary, judiciary did something, but we need the bar council to do something. Um, and it can be something as simple as let's say having. Um, that cyber cyber law um, insurance up so that people can be you know can feel better about adopting tech and maybe a list of um tech service providers out there there's not many so you can you know have a very short list of that uh, to be circulated so yeah I think uh yeah that lay people as well lay people have to be more uh more aware about legal in general because Malaysians um. Malaysian's knowledge, even with current affairs, is actually very, very low. Um, I think that it has it has gone up uh, the past uh, couple of years, but their perspective with law and their interaction with law is not often and it is not a uh, good experience enough. Like if I want to put it in a Facebook way, it's like a tag way, it's like the UI UX is not good. <laughs> So they need they need to have that uh, confidence for the judiciary and with law uh, in order to get all of this uh, built up. I actually want to follow up with Jenna on a question I have. Because earlier you've mentioned that in China, they've moved from paper currency to cryptocurrency. China is quite big, right? It's a lot bigger than Malaysia. How Do, do you happen to know how they managed to get the whole country to move towards fintech in this manner? Um. So they, they went from like 
paper, cash paper to digital, I mean to, to cashless. So they are uh, moving into central bank digital currency right now. I think the key thing was uh, many factors. I think the first one was you know, they, they all became very tech savvy. I think that's the first one. And when you become tech savvy, it's actually very easy to consume and use uh, cashless transactions. Uh, the, so I think social media encouraged that. For example, uh, WeChat Pay, Alipay, those are the two key things where people actually transact, even when they actually go abroad. So it, it, it became a, a social norm. Uh, a, a normal thing so when we let's say go over to China it's going to be quite uh, weird when we actually give them cash I think that actually happened before I think the second one was it's it has been very, very encouraging maybe from the regulator side so those are the two things that I would say that is sped up uh, with the uh, cashless transactions uh, can I add on to that because I'm very interested in this too yeah. do you know that beggars in China use uh, WeChat Pay as well so that 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 is how crazy it is because all they need to do is to print out the QR code laminate it and then you know you can donate to them but lawyers uh, legal tech they use WeChat to serve cost papers and they use WeChat to um to serve judgments as well to search for judgments sorry to search for judgments against yourself if you have a judgment against you as a judgment debtor and you run right um, court officers can actually find you and serve uh, on you through WeChat but I think uh, the reason why we, they can do it is uh, not democratic country la. so ours may be a little um, harder but I think there are things that we can learn from China so you transitioned from lawyering to co-founding a cybersecurity firm and imagine you have to put away your skills as a lawyer and put on a CEO hat what are the skills needed to get there do you need to learn finance did you take a degree or something like that uh, so what Danny mentioned is, is really something that was quite difficult when I jumped out from law uh, it took me two years to understand technology and outside of law per se so I got to I always imagine that I'm actually driving a manual car <laughs> so gear one gear two gear three so gear one could be law gear two could be marketing gear three could be finance right I actually took out a master's uh, which is part of uh, education tech so meaning that uh, it's not a traditional school it is called a quantic school of technology and business it's actually master's MBA so that was that was quite interesting because it refreshed my accounting days uh, in A level, but definitely you got to also switch out from your law hat because you're not just wearing the legal and de risking hat anymore. You're trying to create business um, as well. So there are all sorts of things. Um, I think Melissa can also comprehend this, you know, from digital marketing to, you know, project management to coming up with a presentation deck, for example, uh, to pitching to others. I think all these. Uh, necessary skills all business owners will need to actually acquire but then I guess you know for me I'm not sure about Melissa it's quite nice uh, to actually the fact that I actually studied law because I actually can craft out my own agreements I know how to structure a deal so it has been a really good uh, one to start from the, the law career how many years were you in practicing prior to jumping out of law yeah, I think I, I didn't really share the beginnings, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to give a bit of brief, I did the full, you know, like the career path. Um, I did the twinning. I went to the UK, graduated there. I actually did CLP. That's where Melissa and I were, you know, classmates. And uh, I did uh, chambering. Uh, I did uh, corporate law first. And then I did a bit of um, immigration as well because of legal aid. And then when I practiced, I actually went to be um, a partner with my dad. Not very fun, <laughs> but uh, was it was a really stressful one. I had to learn from scratch about litigation, uh, family law as well. I actually practiced in all, uh, the full one is one year as a lawyer, six months paralegal, and of course your normal uh, nine months chambering. But it was very, very intense because while I was chambering and doing law uh, as a law firm partner or legal practice uh, I actually was very active as well at, at young at young lawyers uh, events and programs as well I think it's not about the number of years that I took to step out uh, it's more like what's the purpose that I want to fulfill 
So when I jumped out, it was more of not for the purposes of jumping out. It's more of trying to understand what is out there and why why do I feel that hunger to learn more? Uh, it's not that I got bored out of law, but it's more like, is there anything else that is very challenging for me that I can incorporate law or maybe bring back to the legal profession? That was my mindset. Um, and obviously, uh, because my dad is also a lawyer, I had to negotiate <laughs> A, di- a year to actually try out other things but I think uh, in hindsight it was also that I was quite exhausted uh, because uh, from graduating from the UK a straight away jump to CLP uh, it was all back to back I never had a proper break and I even secured my chambering position before I uh, finished my CLP so it was all back to back They the law firm even requested for me to jump into chambering uh, before I got my results like be a paralegal or something so it was yeah it was all back to back I think that was part of it uh, that journey I think Navina had a question earlier um, just in terms of the growth in legal technology I feel that it would be really helpful if the bar committees state bar committees can get involved having the support I mean, this is not something that is incentive driven, um, like some other countries. Having the support would help. It's just to ensure some a proper uniform group. That's one thing. And it's also to good to have a committee that can be a bridge. That means legal practitioners who have a passion for it or legal practitioners who have some idea or some experience being the link, the bridge between the legal practitioners. Uh, firms and service providers. So everyone knows what's happening, uh, what tools, what apps, what platforms would be useful. And I'm not talking about, okay, yes, we have e-filing and all things like that, but I'm talking about platforms, um, tools that will make working life, just day-to-day working life much easier. Things like that, that doesn't, that don't require us to send someone out to the printers and spend half a day there or collating stuff. Simple day-to-day working things that will make your life so much easier. Because I had a taste of what it's like uh, when I was practicing overseas. And when I came back home, there was nothing Um, No one was interested. No one heard about it. Everyone's very safe, uh, felt very safe with their security blankets, hard copy, everything. It was very, very different. I wish that there'd be more people coming out and saying, yes, there are these items. Because for some of the legal practitioners that I've spoken to, if you know and if you see how it works, if you can give them the example, Mr. Wan Zafran's bundle, for example, that's an example that if he can come and talk about it and show us how it works, at the back of our mind, we'll be thinking like, Oh my God, for this matter, I can u- utilize that. You know, day-to-day simple things to just to get it kick-started, just to get it going. Because legal technology, the term keeps, it's bandied about, yes, but what are examples are there out there? What simple, basic examples that we can use to make our working life so much easier, so much smoother. And time, if we can cut it down, it'd be fantastic. We can take more things on, we can check our work and get it. The quality would be there, we won't be rushing is what I'm looking for. In. Um, I definitely agree with you, um, Divinia. I think that uh, that is one, that is why I say, you know, sharing knowledge is very uh, important. And that is what I aim to do with the Discord server. I, I think you are right, uh, you know, about showing uh, what all these things can do. And I think that some state bus have already kind of like uh, brought that up. Some they have limited to like e-review, you know, e-hearing. But I think that given time, they will grow, they will branch out. For the benefit of everyone else who doesn't know what merch is, um, in case they don't know, it's basically you <clears throat> put some information, you can change automatically change certain parts of a letter, say the address, you can put a field in Excel and you merge them together. So you have like a list of addresses running down Excel. Then you have a template in Word, and then when you merge them together, the address will automatically change. So that it's really helpful, especially like for things like letters of demand writing. Can, can I invite you maybe to explain, uh, or maybe even Davina, give examples of what legal tech will look like for, for law firms? Because I completely agree, a lot of people are not able to imagine what legal tech would practically be on a day-to-day setting. I'll just give a live example, uh, huh, since uh, I have those. So I have a friend who is a in in a in a partnership, okay, a partnership, and there are only the two of them. And I think uh they have like two clubs. They have problems co- communicating with the clubs. 
uh, during the MCO because everybody's at home, right? And here's 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 a very real problem uh, between the communication uh, within a law firm. Lawyers may have uh, laptops and, and good stable Wi-Fi, but clerks may not have that. And clerks have kids as well who are now unable to go to school and have to use their maybe one laptop in the whole house to, to you know go for their Google classroom so I think that is a that is why I where I think uh, that the bar can come in um, we were discussing this sorry discussing this earlier to kind of like have a list of uh, what hardwares to buy you know like what computers to buy or if there are there any lease options that law firms can uh, take on so that may solve that problem um but once the clubs have access uh, to the internet, you know, stable internet and have a laptop and everything. How do you communicate with them? Some law firms use uh, Teams. Some law firms use Zoom. I always think that Zoom is good and then you have to use that with Google. Uh, I think that Google is a very good starting point. So you can use Google to, let's say, okay, for example, you go to court, right? You go to court, physically go to court and uh, you, you want to key in, you know, uh, your case management uh, minutes instead of writing it on your folder you can go to google calendar and write the note there okay what happened and then that google calendar can be synced across the law firms you don't need to uh what you call this uh log in to each other's emails you can just view it within your own google calendar and i think a lot of law firms lawyers don't know that and then if let's say you have emails that come in you have google form which you can use google form for client intake that is compliant with the dcr that that all lawyers are going uh crazy about right now because we need to comply with that you can delegate that to the client to do it you know to do half of that job and that's half of your your job done for dcr use google form for client intake and it will link to your google drive which will become your uh, soft copy uh, folder of your case. These are the things that I think uh, a lot of firms can use. Yeah, if I may. So in 2018, I went to Singapore and attended my first hackathon. And it is after that hackathon that I came back, brain exploded because Singapore is um, way, way, way ahead. And I think Davina's is smiling there because she knows exactly what I mean. And it's because of that that the Future in Tech Committee was started up at Bar Council. Yeah. Um, so the goal of that committee was to push for technology, to push to enable the use of technology in law firms and at the time because um, it was something that I wanted so I pushed the president of that time who very kindly caved in um, to set up that committee and it's different from the cyber law committee right so the goals are very very specific to empower our lawyers using technology that's it so I didn't use fancy words like legal tech it was just give them the support they need. So we did simple things like we went to Microsoft and we spoke to Microsoft and negotiated special rates at that time, Office 365. And we rolled it out. You know how many people signed up? One, because the lawyers didn't want to spend money, right? So today, the Microsoft suite of products is like bread and butter. So, but the thing is when we roll it out, special rates, discounts, great offers and everything like that, there's a lot of hesitation, a lot of caution by lawyers and law firms, maybe because of lack of familiarity, because they're afraid of the financial commitment but i tell you what the biggest secret is they don't do it because they don't see the long-term use so you subscribe to something today and then you know you're going to pass it to your clerk or your la or whoever it is but if you are not driving it it's going to hit a brick wall and whatever investments you make whether in purchase or in subscription are just going to fail right and then you're gonna oh you know i got played out by legal tech you didn't it's just that there was no follow-through right in the Future and Tech Committee, now known as the Innovation and Future of Law Committee, um, we wanted to do things like educate people about cloud computing. A lot of lawyers store data on the cloud. Do you know the laws governing that storage facility, which jurisdiction it is in, how much of the data is protected, what happens if the server crashes. Our own lawyers, our legal community themselves are not aware. We still haven't talked about it. I also hoped, and this one would have required LPA amendment, um, that we would actually set up sandboxes in the, the committee, right? Set up sandboxes to do what exactly Davina said, to take vendors, to take lawyers, to put them in the same space together, to let the vendors put their products in the 
sandbox and for lawyers and law firms to try out these products at special rates and whatever, to get trained, to provide feedback to the vendors so that there is reciprocation. And then in the longer term, to put a suite of products out at very, very special rates, endorsed by or supported by or whatever, by council, okay, because this has gone through um, the system. So I'm still hopeful because we have a new committee, we have new chairpersons, new co-chairpersons who are pretty amazing. So hang in there um, and we'll see what happens. So um, I'm actually uh, going to open up my own practice. So I was actually thinking of venturing into AI law. So that, that is, uh, this is what sparked my interest. Uh, I feel like I, I don't know anything yet, you know, so because I don't know. I understand that um, upon reading articles, uh, articles that I've come across that um, a lot of law firms that uh, deal with AI law deal with the regulation part of it. Yeah, I need to, well, okay, maybe maybe a question that I can ask is that uh, if you intend to uh, venture into this practice area, um, whether there's a starting point I can, like, uh, maybe a point of reference. So, Marissa, before we jump into that, maybe I could ask you a bit more. You're looking at AI from which angle? Are you looking in general or in fintech or in legal tech? Okay, okay. Uh, well, um, yeah, um, probably fintech. Um, when I say AI, I understand that it's quite broad. I don't actually have solid understanding of what it covers. I know about uh, slightly more about fintech uh, because it involves banking and finance. So uh, maybe maybe you can give me um, a point of reference for fintech. I think AI itself, like I think how would I put it, AI, blockchain, they consider technology. So they themselves will not be regulated in fintech. So if you look at AI, I think it's closely linked to robo advisory. Uh, which is closely linked to, it is currently regulated uh, by Securities Commission Malaysia. Yeah, if you Google Robo Advisory, uh, which is to do with the capital market side, the investment side, that's where your AI comes in. So I I, I hope that that will be a good start for you. I'm just curious, uh, why are you interested in AI, AI law? You see, uh, prior to me uh, deciding to start up my own firm, I was, uh, I spoke to um, uh, some senior practitioners and um, I'll, you know this thinking about I, I come from a litigation background so I've done medical negligence I've done uh, corporate commercial negligence I've done alternative dispute resolution yeah I've done you know uh, adjudication construction besides having uh, I, I was thinking you know if I were to open up a general practice you know how am I going to compete uh, considering the fact that you know there's so many good good firms out there and uh, you know uh, I was thinking of um, keeping my options open and I know that uh, fintech is like a relatively new area uh, I don't think many lawyers actually know about fintech law so that that is actually the reason why okay I don't really know about AI law right now I th- but I think that it's still growing in Malaysia so okay. you would kind of like be doing what uh, Jenna and I have been doing for fintech and legal tech you will be need you will need to be um, very in touch with regulators in order to grow um, AI law in Malaysia rather than, um, I mean, while you practice in it, but I don't think it would be something like we do for uh, for the litigation cases that you have done because those are already settled law, you see. How, how do you get in touch with the regulators? So you're talking about SC and BNM and all, right? So you will need to attend those events that uh, Jenna had mentioned previously. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I can add, uh, normally the regulators minimize their interaction with the private industry because they have to look like they're they're neutral. So if you want to get access to regulators, a lot of times you look at like fintech news and um, the publications that they have out there. So it's really to understand the mindset of regulators. It's quite different how we interact with judges as well. Maybe Melissa and Mar- Melissa and Jenna, you can just share how they can contact you if they have any questions to follow up. I'm just going to put my email there <laughs> because I may miss uh, some, you know, like LinkedIn messages. Please pardon me and we can speak from there if you are, you're quite interested. Um, I basically leave on Discord now <laughs> so you can join the server and contact me there. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. I hope you enjoyed today's session and it was informative for all of you and you have like some takeaways from today's session. Thank you very much once again to our speakers and hope you all have a good night.